Greetings, everybody. This is your favourite unicorn demon, B. Harper from Supermassy.com, and welcome back to another review. Today, I'm going to be looking at 1973's supernatural western, High Plains Drifter, directed by and starring Mr. Clint Eastwood. Now, before I continue into the review, allow me to give you a little bit of a backstory about the development of, of the script. Uh, the writer, Ernest Tiedemann, when he was in the process of making the treatment for what would become High Plains Drifter, he was very heavily inspired and deeply troubled by the case of Kitty Genovese. Kitty Genovese was a young woman who was murdered in front of a lot of people in her own home, or rather her housing complex. You see, it was only one attacker who was, who was killing her, but a lot of people were either watching or ignoring her pleas for help. Nobody thought to call the cops while this was happening. Nobody thought about assembling a small group to chase this one man off. And absolutely nobody thought to help Kitty. And unfortunately, Kitty, Kitty died. She was horrendously murdered by this, this lunatic. And it just comes down to the fact that while we like to think that when we see somebody who is in trouble, we would help them out, in the case of Kitty Genovese... Nobody came to help. Nobody thought to act together as a group to help this poor girl who was being murdered in front of their very eyes. So bearing this in mind, when Clint Eastwood took on the story and uh, decided to not only you know, direct the film but put himself in the lead role, he actually went on the record as a quote, uh, or rather went on the record to quote uh, the, the inspiration for this movie. So this is what Eastwood says. It's just an allegory, a speculation on what happens when they, they being the townspeople in the movie, go ahead and kill the sheriff and somebody comes back and calls the town's conscience to bear. There's always retribution for your deeds. High Plains Drifter is definitely a revenge film and when it comes to American cinema and the concept of revenge, it Revenge movies are a dime a dozen. We know that. Whereas in Japanese uh, film, uh, say directed by Akira Kurosawa, or rather those samurai samurai films that focus heavily on revenge, revenge in those films is used as a last resort, when every other avenue of reasoning and democracy is worn out. Whereas in American films, revenge tends to be a very Judeo-Christian type of thing, eye for an eye. You do wrong to me, therefore I feel justified in doing wrong to you. And God will not punish me. So without giving too much away about High Plains Drifter, the town of Largo is a very depraved place. Everybody in that town are either rapists, rapists, murderers, thieves, you know, any sort of malcontent you can think of lives in this town. And by the way, in Mandarin, the word Largo means trust. How's that for irony? So it all comes together in a head when one night the sheriff is brutally beaten by a bunch of outlaws. Now sometime later, a stranger played by Clint Eastwood arrives and nobody knows who he is, nobody knows where he comes from, but he obviously has an agenda in mind. And that agenda is vengeance. The stranger played by Clint Eastwood is a very, very fascinating character. On one end, he is absolutely ruthless, and he doesn't make any apologies for the actions that he does. Whereas, on another end of the spectrum, when he connects with somebody who is, in comparison to the rest of the residents of Ligo, who is pure of heart, he tends to be very kind and very respectful to them. For example, there are two individuals that the stranger takes very kindly to. Uh, Sarah, who is the wife of a uh, hotelier, and uh, a man who is vertically challenged, a uh, fellow uh, who runs a barbershop named Mordecai. Both of them are, in a sense, moral outcasts, with everybody else being the, the, the hell spawn they are, essentially. Now, um, both of these relationships are quite different. Sarah basically becomes a lover for the stranger. They have a very mutual and passionate relationship. Whereas with the, uh, the, the barber, uh, Mordecai, uh, the stranger interacts with him in a very sort of friendly and, uh, you know, very genial manner. But of course, he's not too sort of saccharine about it. Everybody else 
in this movie is a target to the stranger because they all willfully took place in the murder of the sheriff. Now, before I continue, there are two very interesting scenes in this movie. Both of them involve two female characters with the stranger. The first is Callie, and uh, Callie is more or less... If we were to, to put on a completely biblical allegory for who this character is, she may be the Whore of Babylon. That, I think that's the best way to look at this movie. Think of this film as a very, very American version of the Bible. So Callie is the, the town bike, shall we say. She, she's very rude, very loose, and very risque. And let's just say that her standards when it comes to men isn't particularly very high. So upon meeting the stranger, you know, she taunts him and she, you know, willfully puts herself into danger to piss him off. So he wrangles her into a barn and, you know, roughly has sex with her. Now that scene is interesting because even though Callie is willfully, or rather becomes willfully involved with a stranger in this encounter, there's definitely a sense that when it starts, it is like sexual assault. Now, with the other female character, Sarah, who I previously mentioned, when she and the stranger get together, he can tell that she is not like the other people who live in this town. She did not approve of what happened to the sheriff who was beaten to death, and, you know, somehow the stranger knows about this. So when he and Sarah make love, it is precisely that. It's gentle, it's mutual, and it's consensual. So just sort of bearing those allegories in mind, like uh, Sarah, in a sense, may be, shall we say, Mary Magdalene, and Callie is the Whore of Babylon. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I honestly don't think that, you know, Eastwood was trying to make a sexist type of statement when it, when it came to these two characters, because all in all, everybody who, or just about everybody who lives in this town is definitely guilty. There is no question that what the stranger does to them in this case, in this very extenuating circumstance, they deserve it. And may I say, the final act of this film shows some of the finest examples of retribution ever on screen. Everybody who is responsible, directly or indirectly responsible for the death of the sheriff, they get a worthy comeuppance. But nobody gets it worse than those who actually had the whip that they used to beat the sheriff with. It is so damn good. Obviously this whole film is about revenge and the whole sort of Judeo-Christian eye for an eye sort of thing. But in saying that, when you keep in mind that, you know, under these circumstances and with these types of very unsavory and malicious type of characters, you find yourself being behind the stranger. You find yourself thinking, yes, I would totally do that. Or yes, I would totally support this guy. So when you put into, into perspective about what's happening, what the stranger does makes absolute sense. Even though in common circumstances, what the stranger would be doing is really no worse than what the stranger, or rather, or what the characters of Largo do. It's really, really fascinating. And I like it when a movie is able to call these ambiguities that we all have within us to the fore. Um, and, and, as we all know, like Eastwood has become a really strong director now. Not all of his films have been that good in recent years, but the guy had, you know, even back in the, the, the earlier stages of his career, he still had an eye. Um, he was very heavily influenced by Sergio Leone, and uh, we, all, we all know that. Um, and he also just really appreciates having genuine talent in front of and behind the camera. Um, what else can I say about this? Well, when I consider uh, who else, who, who the stranger represents, well, you've probably already guessed. The stranger could be, and, and this is not made for certain in the movie, but the stranger could be the sheriff who was beaten. Now, even though the film takes a couple of measures to sort of like uh, misdirect you about who the stranger is and whether or not he is actually related to the sheriff, there can be little doubt in the final frame of this movie that the stranger is somebody familiar to the town. And going on from that, this whole film, as you can probably guess, is just beautifully shot. Once again, it is so heavily influenced by Sergio Leone, and thanks to Eastwood's countless collaborations with uh, Leone, 
every single shot has a sense of meaning and symbology about it. And, and symbology is a very difficult thing to do in movies. It can either come across as appropriate and it's one that sticks with you and it really makes you think, or it can be it can be completely ham-fisted and you're just like, what is this wank, you know? So, <laughs> um, but Eastwood, to his credit, really does utilize the, the, the gift of symbolism without turning it into a curse. Um, if I were to think about Largo, it, once again, in a completely biblical sense, it would be like, say, Sodom and Gomorrah. And interesting note, you never see children in this town. Or if there are children there, we don't see them. So, in a sense, the stranger comes to Largo to eliminate it from the earth. He doesn't necessarily come to purify it because it is way beyond purification. And, um, for, you know, say for our Sarah and Mordecai, nobody else can be saved. Everybody's, everybody else has chosen to walk this path of, of sin and, you know, gluttony and, you know, all the seven sins, essentially. Um, they, they have willfully made this choice. So there is no, there is no way to save them. And quite frankly, I don't think they want to be saved. They have grown so used to this terrible way of life and being so willfully ignorant and malicious and murderous and you know every single undesirable quality that a human being can exhibit this is what the residents of Lago have and once again it's coming back to the idea that in this in this case and only in this case everybody deserves what they get it's a really really interesting movie and I really do wish I could further discuss with you all the other, you know, things that are going on in this movie. But it is it is one of those westerns that kind of stand apart from the rest of them. It has it plays out, like I said, in, as a very sort of biblical tale. Of course, though, you know, Eastwood is never one to directly ram down any sort of uh, commentary he has on anything. But still, it, it really makes you wonder. And it makes you question to yourself, you know, what would you do in this situation? Would you cheer the stranger on, or would you condemn him for being just as bad as the res residents of Largo? So, um, yeah, that was my review of High Plains Drifter, and I give High Plains Drifter a... a 5 out of 5. I know. I I know. Yesterday, when I said you know the the good, the bad, and the ugly is perhaps one of my like my favorite Western movie, but High Plains Drifter is another one of those films that I can just watch over and over again and find new meaning to. Like I said, it's no real mystery about who the stranger is ultimately, but everything else, everything he does, and the way that the the camera moves and how it frames like particular scenes nothing in this film feels superfluous everything has a purpose all thanks to Eastwood's directing and the, the story written by Ernest Tigerman it's a really really good movie and I don't think I've ever really seen another really quality supernatural western before there have been supernatural horrors and everything but supernatural westerns you know that that's a very very rarely uh, visited sort of film genre. So props to this movie for actually making it successful. Um, will there be another High Plains Drifter type of movie? I, I, I don't think so. That's a completely different conversation for another time. So thank you very much, guys, for listening to me ramble and for tolerating my screechy birds in the background. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I shall see you again in the next video. Bye-bye for now.